everybody. Can you hear me? Alrighty. Is lunch great? Lunch is great, huh? All right. So in this panel, we will be talking responsive layout, and George Crawford is our opener. He is the lead developer of the Economis HTML5 project and the maintainer of FT Column Flow, which is this really cool magazine-like thingy that I hope he will explain to all of us. Um, then we have Razvan. Uh, he works on CSS regions, CSS exclusions, and other ways of improving digital publishing on the web. Then we have Andy over here. He was formerly the lead engineer on Bing Maps and then worked for the awesome Clear Left offices in Brighton. And currently he does the client side work at uh, Guardian. So, uh, George, if you want to come up and give your presentation. So responsive design is a bit of a buzzword, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but it sort of lacks definition. I know. First slide's coming up. <laughs> so responsive design, it, it lacks definition, we need some clarity. I'm sure you've all thought uh, from time to time about the various considerations we need to take in mind when thinking about responsive development. I like to quote on Andy's blog, responsiveness is what a website does when it's loaded into an unknown browser on an unknown device by an unknown individual. So websites need to respond to the device and the environment and to the user and to many other factors to offer the best experience. But dealing with all of these considerations is far too broad for this session. So we're just gonna talk about responsive layout. So, Here's a typical example of a site that really thinks about responsive layout, but only really based on viewport width. This is something I stole from Amber's blog post, the United Pixel Workers. Yeah, it's funky and it, it's, it's a really nice sort of interactive experience. Um, but does it really answer all of the questions that we need to answer? So we don't need to just consider the aesthetics of a layout, but also the whole effect on the reading experience and the, the way that a user will behold the site. Like if we need to do extra processing to achieve a better layout, we might need to wait longer for the network, we might need to wait for the CPU, we might decrease the frame weight. So following the uh, discussion we had earlier in the network panel, um, we need to consider things like this. Um, with The Economist web app that I've been working on, our first page load, we just use real links to real images. But as the user navigates to an edition, subsequent articles we download with Ajax requests, and we actually send the dimensions of the viewport in the request so that images can be dynamically resized on the server Base64 encoded, added in line to the HTML. Now there are obviously pros and cons to that as we've discussed, but it, it has a, a great um, advantage in that we don't need to do so much work on the client. And also once the first of, of a type of a device, like the first iPad or the first playbook has uh, rendered that article, we can store it in the cache for faster performance in the future. So uh, my experience is mostly with the Financial Times and The Economist, which are very much reading platforms. So let's look at the, some of the problems that uh, newspapers and magazines prevent, uh, pre present on the web. So the FT wanted a column layout, it, which is obviously inspired by their print edition. CSS columns is useful, but it's not enough even to create a simple layout like this. This headline that spans column one and two, you can't do that with CSS columns. You have the options to span all of the columns or one of the columns. So we need to turn to JavaScript straight away. And our first uh, approach was to iterate through every single word in a paragraph, even in an optimized way, find out where to cut the paragraph and move the contents to the next column. You know that dealing with text is, is really uh, bad for performance. So we looked into other ways of, of speeding this up. And we developed FT Column Flow. This is Column Flow in action on the Economist app. And actually, the FT, the page before, was also running Column Flow. And if we look a bit closer at what's happening here, we can see the paragraphs highlighted in red. And you can see that the paragraph at the bottom of column one has been cloned and move to the top of column two. So yes, we have twice the weight in the DOM, but if we hide the overflow, 
we get a nice result. And it's actually much faster than iterating through each word in the paragraph. So column flow has some other features which really help with responsive layout. You can add classes onto the flows, um, flowed elements to stop elements wrapping. So by default, for example, it doesn't wrap images. You can also keep headings attached to the paragraph which follows them. And you can position fixed elements like headlines and images on a particular page, a particular column, spanning any number of columns. Column flow will try and avoid orphaned lines at the ends of paragraphs, so it would prefer two lines in the next column rather than one line on its own. And it will uh, try and determine the vertical grid height and add padding dynamically to images and headlines so that they conform to the grid. So that you get a nice vertical uh, uh, vertical grid running through the uh, page. Column flow does have some side effects. It's not perfect. Um, one interesting one is that fonts must be loaded before it runs. If a font loads after column flow has laid out the absolute position of each paragraph, then you get into big problems. You can see here that there's clipping at the bottom of column one and at the top of column two. So in The Economist, we actually use a font preloader which presents a whole load of other problems. Um, anyone who's looked into uh, determining precisely when a font loads, it's a nightmare. Um, there's a CSS3 fonts module, which will hopefully in the future add an onload event or something similar for fonts, but not much browser support yet, of course. So taking it further, how might we improve the Economist responsive layout? I've uh, hacked the code base a little bit, added some experimental enhance. One, two, okay. So this uh, article layer is designed for the iPad. And what that means is that the number of columns is hard-coded, and even the aspect ratio of the image is determined editorially for the iPad layout. So when we launched on hardware with a different aspect ratio, the easiest solution is to add white gutters on the sides. It's not a terrible solution, but it's not. It's losing a little element of that immersive experience. So why can't we add some flexibility to this? We don't need to hard code the number of columns. We can determine the optimum number of columns by thinking about things like the typographic measure. So the, the measure is the number of characters in a line, and as the font size changes, the number of characters you can fit in a line will also change. So if we go for an ideal typographic measure, then we can also, based on the viewport, we can also determine the ideal number of columns. We can improve legibility a bit by modifying the line height. So for longer lines of text, it's a generally accepted principle that you want a bit more space between lines, and for shorter lines, a bit less line height. These are quite well-known print concepts, but they're only slowly coming to the web as our devices pro provide more and more immersive reading experiences, and also there's some technology that we, we're waiting for too. We can vary the number of columns that the image spans based on the total number of columns and also the width and also the height of the viewport, because we have to take the aspect ratio into account. So this is the first draft. Um, it's making better use of the available space. It's more immersive. It feels like your, the app has been tailor-made for your screen. And it does increase the legibility. I'll just run through a range of viewport sizes. You can see some of the things that we're changing. So as the line length increases, it goes too far for the ideal measure. So we add in extra columns. And you can see the line height changing slightly based on the length of the lines. And that image started off spanning one column, then to two, then to three. So the same logic can be applied to a static viewport, but when the user is changing the font size. So as we increase the font size, we have fewer characters per line, so we actually need fewer columns. We can go even further improving the article's typesetting. We can learn from techniques used to lay out newspaper columns like hyphenation and justification. So the default here is a ragged right edge, which with a narrow column gets a little bit difficult to read. But if you set justification, it doesn't help that much. 
just we get these large areas of white space and they can sometimes form very ugly rivers. So we can add in hyphenation. CSS hyphenation, again, doesn't have great browser support, so I've used a JavaScript library here. And uh, performance analysts might worry about this. It, it took 10 milliseconds to hyphenate this entire article. So I think it's uh, worth considering for text-heavy layouts. Now, we mentioned in the network session, uh, session earlier that we might be able to do more with images and responsive image uh, workflows. So maybe it's worth considering on the editorial side that they might even embed metadata into image files with a selection of possible crops. So you might be able to choose on the client side a range of aspect ratios, some maybe a tighter crop if the image is going to be very small. And then you can determine based on the size and the aspect ratio of the space you have, which would be the best one of those crops to use. So we could improve this layout by maybe having a, a shorter and wider image or having a tighter crop that can just occupy one column. So what technology do we have around for our disposal for responsive layouts and, and what's coming up? You've probably all seen grids like this, the 960 grid and Twitter's bootstrap. These don't give a perfect solution for the responsive layout. They're either completely fixed width or they only adapt a little bit and then instantly snap to a single column on mobile devices. So we've got some emerging technologies which will help us a lot. In The Economist and the FT, we're using Flexbox to help with layouts. It's very powerful and, and can be quite complicated. Um, then the CSS grid layout module, um, which is only currently in Internet Explorer, is going to help a lot with designing responsive grid layouts. And then Razvan's team at Adobe are working on some really nice proposals for new CSS modules. The CSS regions and pagination templates for rich magazine-like layouts. So I've devoted quite a lot of time to column flow, but with any luck, modules like this will eventually make it redundant. Until we get browser support, of course, we do need JavaScript polyfills to do the same job. And then the CSS exclusions, allowing you to flow text inside and outside shapes and even images. And we've got technology like seamless iframes, web components, the shadow DOM, custom elements, which, when they're combined, might lead to give us context agnostic encapsulated modules of HTML and CSS, which can adapt and respond to their available space rather than actually worrying about the viewport so much. So we're looking into this a lot for the FT web app, creating individually styled modules which can be dropped into any part of any page without interfering with other elements. So hopefully that's given you some ideas about responsive layouts for magazines and newspapers, but what about the other problems that other sites have? And uh, how else do people deal with responsive layouts? I'll hand you back to Amber. All right, so our first question is actually um, going to be my question because it is a problem that I have been facing lately, and I'm sure many other devs have, um, kind of with the performance um, talk as well, but is it worth taking the performance hit and extra time um, deving to serve up retina images, or should we only pay attention to retina images when it's really important for things like icons or photo-heavy websites? Because a lot of sites um, don't really matter as far as um, the images go. So, George? Well, my experience with the FT and The Economist is that when you first, first of all, it's a shock to see your site on a, on a retina display when you haven't prepared for it. Um, it. It's really interesting, the difference between a, a large JPEG image like the ones I was showing and the tiny interface icons. I think because we're so used to really nice font rendering and really nice uh, PDF support, um, just seeing a, a, a PNG, a tiny file that could easily be doubled without worrying too much about the overhead, it really makes a big difference. And I think you can get away with, with uh, non-retina large JPEGs. And I think that's definitely the first step. And 
maybe then look into how much overhead you're going to add with large feature images. But of course, some sites are not using feature images to the extent that we do. Yeah, I think, I think it depends exactly what you're trying to do on a given site or a given page. Clearly, a lot of the stuff in the newspapers is about high-resolution imagery, and, and we have apps that are uh, specifically tailored to showing those in sort of engaging, beautiful ways. So those those do need to be um, the high-resolution stuff. I think for the more kind of Chrome interface stuff, I'm sort of in two minds. I mean, I think as much as you can get the browser to render this stuff itself kind of natively and get away from images with... Um, you know, some of the visual stuff in CSS, you know, making sure you're using rounded corners and drop shadows as much as... And then icon fonts and things like that. Yeah, well, right? yeah and SVG to a degree as well. Um, and then I think it depends. I, some, some icons, I'm not that fussed about them not looking as great. I think things like the logo is where you notice it. Um, and all other people notice it as well. Taking, um, I, I've worked with The Economist uh, on uh, getting the articles to work offline and the number of stages you go through where you add size to, to the data. So you, if we base64 encode our images and then store them in, in uh, WebSQL or IndexedDB, which tends to be um, base16 encoded, you're adding every time you, you uh, encode the image differently, you're adding massively to the overhead. So if we then double the size of the, or quadruple the size of the image file as well, this is this is a big issue. But I, as I say, I think interface icons are, are really important and other things not so. Okay, so our own Andrew over here asked um, an important question. Is increased page weight an inevitable side effect of responsive web design versus a plain, uh, versus just a regular separate mobile site? Yeah, so <clears throat> if you talk about responsive websites and you look at images, for example, like retina images, there's no clear cut way of getting around that. Yes, you will have increased uh, file size with responsive websites. But then again, uh, as Elia and other people mentioned earlier, uh, the overhead you have afterwards is just some HTML and some CSS, and we're hoping to have uh, the extra markup you're using for responsive layouts uh, fixed in um, uh, proposals such as grid layout or flexbox, because that's mainly where you're adding extra markup or extra CSS to handle uh, various parts of your responsive layout. So in terms of adding size, yes, I think right now um, responsive websites do incur a, pe a price penalty in file size if you want to deal with different size images, which you should if you do care about the performance uh, on different devices and different browsers. I, I think you've got to be careful about taking, to, taking it to extremes, though, because you, you can start going down a road where you end up um, polyfilling things like media queries in older versions of i8, which, you know, there are libraries... Um, to do that, and they do it very well, but I think that, that's kind of missing the point. I mean, if you, if you have to add more and more of these pieces of these JavaScript libraries and uh, polyfills and the like to make stuff responsive, I think you, you will end up in a situation where your responsive site's mobile view, if you like, is worse than it would have been if you just optimized for mobile in the first place. Yeah, I, I totally agree on this. So, of course, you need to look at the device, the context, and where people are going to use it. And of course, it doesn't make any sense to polyfill for media queries and the like. And so, yeah, I, 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 do, I do agree. We, you go, you find your lowest common denominator, and you build up from that, but you ensure you give your users a good experience. Uh, the point is that you, I, I am in favor of quite a lot of polyfills right now because there's a lot of the technology that hasn't been tested quite yet, and everybody's waiting for it to come into browsers. Mm -hmm. And polyfills give you a very good opportunity to build a technology, experiment with it, and learn that some use cases just don't fit, like see the app cache model. Yeah, so all the column flow stuff. I think um, we, at every stage of the way, we need to bear in mind the good user interface as well. That as soon as people get onto the bandwagon of responsive design and, and layout and development, uh, it's so easy to add bells and whistles that really aren't necessary or to 
change the feature image for each 50 pixel breakpoint as the user re resizes their browser window and, and, and things like that. And you have to really, really consider how your users are going to uh, work through the site and whether some of the enhancements are really necessary. Well, kind of uh, related to polyfills is, you know, the newest CSS3 um, specs and stuff are getting really, really complicated in the area of responsive development and stuff. And uh, a user, oh, you, George, asked, if is it okay to continue to push for more and more CSS modules like regions, grid layout, etc., or is it actually okay to just use JavaScript solutions instead because... Um, you know, I kind of wondered that myself because CSS was known to be a simple language, um, easy to use, easy to learn, and now it's becoming so much more complicated. That's, that's my point totally, that it's not that I believe that we should do these things in JavaScript. Of course, there are um, massive performance gains to be, to be had from, from pushing things to GPUs and all that kind of stuff. But it, just looking at the average uh, CSS file now, um, it's already complicated enough, and I think it's stretch. It, I, a lot of people who've moved to SAS and, and other preprocessors would agree that it's we're pushing the limits of what a, a, a quite a simple syntax can include. And as soon as you know we we get other modules coming in, it just gets more and more complex. And maybe maybe the question is that is CSS the right language or the right technology to to deal with it? Okay, so first of all, uh, that's a very good question. And I'd like to start out with Hakim, the, the guy that built Reveal. He, he sent a tweet recently that we're asking so much more of HTML and CSS right now, considering that it was meant as a, um, a, a text styling um, declarative uh, markup the, uh, language. So <clears throat> in, in response to your question, I do think that we need to push for more uh, CSS module and more support in the browser, specifically on those areas where JavaScript isn't really supposed to be working at, like in terms of layout. The browser itself is doing the layout, so I would much rather leave it do the layout and focus my JavaScript resources, which are also scarce on various devices and given the complexity of web applications, not necessarily the complexity of uh, web design. You, we, we realize that we're sort of almost wasting time by trying to optimize things like column flow because it's it's really a layout, as you say, a layout technology, and and uh, it, it feels counterintuitive to to go over and over and over. You know, why isn't JavaScript perfect for this job? It's because it's not designed for this job. Uh, it's not designed for this job, but the reality is that most CSS modules don't really give you the access you need in JavaScript. So. Up until now, there's been a pretty much uh, all or nothing solution. Is it all in CSS or all in JavaScript? And I really think that uh, stuff like CSS regions, it's intended to be a building block. So it's not going to solve your complete problem in CSS, but it gives you access via the CSS object model so you can understand how your layout has been rendered in your various boxes. And I think that's really where um, CSS and JavaScript should really work together in handling, for example, layout and uh, event handlers and uh, content flow differently. I was really excited to hear that, that when I looked into regions that, yeah, you start off with CSS, but the, when you run out of regions, when you run out of flowed areas, you, JavaScript gets involved, right? You, you can create new elements for, you, you have events and you can create new elements for content to flow into and that you, there's, a, there's an interoperability between the two. Yeah, at, at this point, this is because um, CSS regions is supposed to be a building block and it's, it doesn't handle the complete reflow of the content, and you go to use uh, JavaScript to listen to uh, if your content has fit in all of those regions. And that is seen, as a limit, uh, is seen as a limitation by some people, and to some extent they're right, because you need some sort of uh, method in CSS. If you think about layout, CSS should handle the complete layout. So right now, um, the spec is, is supposed to work uh, really fine with um, other specs like uh, grid layout, but it, it's using empty div elements and it's using the JavaScript just because we don't have any other spec that at, at this point that will work. What I personally would like to see is some sort of adoption of multiple pseudo elements so you can actually define your complete template in, um, in CSS. Because basically that's what I want from my, uh, my, my CSS, right? I, I want it to easily swap out templates, easily flow out content, and leave the markup to handle just the semantics and 
describing my actual content, right? Do you think part of the complexity at the moment is that there are a number of um, emerging new CSS layout modules and it's not necessarily clear until we start playing around with them and experimenting which ones are going to be good for what um, type of problems? So for example, the region stuff is um, enabling lots of very new kind of layouts that haven't been possible at all before really, you know, without things like column flow to in, you know, exclusions in a certain column and things like that. Whereas grid seems to me to be more about helping us do the kind of layouts we've been doing for a while, but in a more, um, well, in a simpler way, um, a way that's more suited to, um, act, you know, a real layout system rather than sort of hacking floats and positioning. Sure, and something the browser can optimize as well, the, the performance of it, yeah. All right, um, so would it be useful to have native CSS media queries at the element component widget level and not just the viewport? And that is um, related to our other question about page weight. Would that help? I, from my point of view, that would be a very nice thing to be able to do. Um, I'm not sh sure that yeah, that's not something you can sort of abstract into a system and have work at the moment for various reasons. Um, but yeah, it's desirable. And maybe there's something around, you know, George mentioned web components and um, being able to, you know, codify behavior for a particular type of interface element and deal with those kind of exceptions that might arise on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. I think this... Um sort of modular idea is, is really interesting. We're in the JavaScript world, we're leaning more and more towards modularized code, which is good development practice anyway. Um, the, the work I mentioned that we were doing is mostly being done by Wilson over there and on the um, FT's web app. And and uh, I mean, he's, he's sort of almost faking the, the shadow DOM and custom elements before it's arrived by uh, using media queries to write before and after pseudo elements with content on individual modules in the page and then in JavaScript reading those behaviors, th th those those uh, tags. So for example, for a certain module, you might, with a before or after um, pseudo element, you write, you might write the words column or row and then the module now knows that it should behave as a column or a row. So that's kind of starting to fake the, the, the media query on a modular level. And I think I mean, who knows what's coming up? I, the, the problem, of course, is that we also always need to uh, to uh, to wait for the browsers to catch up with what, what we need, and the, the spec writers need to wait to hear what we want. But I think this kind of modular layout is, is, is really interesting. Do you think um, that interrupts the idea that the content should be exactly the same on the desktop and mobile that, that um, we're kind of following right now, if we have different you know, are able to swap out different things for um, different viewports. So this is another question that I put in, in the moderator is, uh, I'm, I, I think we probably all come up against on our mobile devices sites that are basically uh, truncated in, in, in terms of their usability until you get to the bottom of the, of the page and you say, you click the link that says view desktop site and then you can actually use some functionality. This gets really, really boring, you know, um, and it's, it's going back to the UI and, and the content providers. Um, is designing for mobile simply cutting out, you know, 30% of the useful information on the page? No, of course it's not. Mm. I think there's, at some point in the past, there's been a, a desire to try and sort of second guess what people call context, you know, what, wh why are you using the site on a mobile device? Oh, it's because you're walking down the street and you want the phone number of the restaurant you're going to. Um, uh, but whether that was ever true or not is kind of irrelevant because it's certainly not true now. Um, and um, deriving some kind of context, I, I don't know how that works. I'm and it not was, sure that you can. It was immediately interesting for me to hear a proposal that on the server for the first request we might know the viewport dimensions and not have to do user agent sniffing. But actually, as, as was pointed out, you can't tell very much from a de about a device just from the viewport dimension. You certainly can't tell the conditions in which it's being viewed. So you don't know whether they want you know a huge word uh, displayed on the screen with the, the answer to their question or whether they want a 
uh, you know, five thousand word article to read because you you can't predict that kind of information. So we need we need to give them flexibility. But I think having a view desktop site link at the bottom of the page is not the answer. <laughs> Yeah, and in terms of using web components, I'm actually quite excited about this because uh, when you think about your content, it's not necessarily only to give it to your users in full and mobile versus on desktop. You also have to think about the context. And if you swap out and you don't think about content like text content, think about web application controls. They're different in an interaction mode on a mobile device rather than on a desktop device. And to answer the question, if media queries are okay inside of web components or small isolated elements. I think that's really um, important and useful because it gives you the flexibility of reusing most of your, uh, most, most of your elements. It, it's not just that they're isolated from each other, but also that they're, they can be dropped into other projects, right? They're isolated really. from the layout from a particular page. Or... So this is a great discussion, but I think that media queries on other elements is the wrong approach. And in, in part because if you look at how the browsers today treat media queries, uh, they don't work too well when the page is being constructed. When we, we don't have access to the viewport, we don't evaluate rules. Like if you look at your rule right now, if you look at WebKit, it says, hey, this looks complicated in the sense that it's not screen, which means that we're just gonna download the resource, right? And this is, this is a fundamental trade-off. We don't know the viewport information when we're constructing this page, so this is not the right mechanism. Right now, if you declare a bunch of CSS styles, we'll download them all, right? So having this information on element is not the right way to do it. What we're talking about here is server-side adaptation. So I, I think that the premise that we need some way to <coughs> exclude certain chunks of kind of functionality is right. I think media queries is the wrong way to do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we would necessarily saying media queries is the, the right technology. I mean, in fact, media queries at the moment I mean, they're kind of what make us fixate on the viewport because that's that's the only, well, in terms of um, you know, measuring the width of something, that's the only thing we have. Um, and it's actually not very interesting um, that you can do that. You can do some interesting things with it, and that's why responsive design now has a name um, and everyone's talking about it. But I think, yeah, it, it's more granular than that. You know, the context of the, with the which you want to respond to from a layout point of view is is more granular than just the viewport and yeah whatever whatever y you guys think is the right way to let us do these kind of things I, I'll go with that. <laughs> so are there any front-end alternatives to responsive web design that can fulfill the promise of being device agnostic or could there be? Java? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what you mean by device agnostic. If you look at the web as we see it right now, yes, uh, HTML, CSS, that fulfills the job of making something responsive. But uh, if you look only just a bit ahead of what devices are coming and what device agnostic means for Google Glass, for example, does a responsive web design work for uh, your contact lens? Um, I think we need to think about that technology and that's maybe a space where native will actually win because the web as we see it right now, it works really okay for one dimensional, two dimensional layout. What happens in three dimensions? Uh, I don't have a clear cut answer to, uh, to that. So whatever we're doing right now, it's optimized for touch, it, it's optimized for uh, pointing, um, different screen sizes, but whenever you change the screen size, and you, you never, you change the interaction model from uh, touching to speaking, for example, does the web uh, offer the same flexibility to like, building responsive? I don't know. What do you guys think? I guess it depends how you define the scope of the web. Um, is, is it any client technology ever? Um, what, what defines the web? Is it the kind of open nature of it, or is it the... I, Yep, I, I think you've said it. <laughs> the answer is no. Right now, um, there isn't a catch-all technology right now. Right. So, um, should the browser be more chatty about its environment, which we spoke about in another um, session, um, should we know what the viewport size is, um, what connection it is, their bandwidth? From the work I've been doing, step one is just well, give us the right information and ideally 
of it in a unified way across browsers. I mean, that would really, really help, right? I mean, just when a, when a device incorrectly dis, um, announces its pixel ratio or something like that, you know, it, it basically means you either add another seven lines of hack or you have to not query that information. And I find that more frustrating, I think, than not knowing some things about the environment. Um, I think we've probably covered uh, network and, and bandwidth and things like that. But I think if what we're trying to do is to provide as immersive an experience as native apps, then yeah, we do need to know a lot about the device that the that, that is displaying the app. But do we need to know about that on the server as well? I think it would help. I, I, I think if, if um, I'm working really hard to store as many issues of The Economist offline on, a, on someone's device. I know I've only got 50 meg and that that's actually 25 because it's all base 16 encoded. And um, I would really like to be able to optimize my images and to package things up and, and um, effectively do what a native iOS app is going to do, which is sort of prepare everything in advance and, and ship it. And then you can cache the hell out of that and you, know, you get a really, really good experience. Um, you do run into issues where if you are running a JavaScript heavy site, you you have to, we've already mentioned like mustache templates on the server and clients. You, you even have to start preparing articles and editions using Node on the server because you have to use the same logic that you're using on the client. But maybe that's, maybe that's fine. Um, I do understand that any changes to HTTP are enormous and you know adding one line to a header is going to massively affect web traffic as a whole but um, I think in return we can stop wasting bandwidth by delivering in totally useless images um, and people are still doing user agent detection on the server to you know sure as, as was said in a mobile tablet or desktop or whatever as we said in an earlier session you know we're doing it already so um, you know test to see which approach is fastest um, and please browser vendors you know either don't declare a property or declare it correctly or you know let us know that it's that it's buggy but it's it's really really makes our life a lot harder when when you give the wrong information uh, just one point to add to this it, it does actually happen uh, on server side right now and it's particularly useful for digital publications when you want to target a whole slew of devices so even though it's not responsive in the responsive sense that it happens on the client side and it reacts to anything, um, there's a lot of versions of the same uh, publication rendered server side and you just um, go there and your device is just the terminal and it receives the end result. And right now that works pretty fine because everything is stored, everything is controlled. Ideally you would want to give this to the end user because you can't really simulate all of the user agents uh, font rendering, um, does it have or doesn't it have um, uh, hyphenation, stuff like that. So it, 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 it's happening right now and I think we should move away from that, but we need to wait for browser vendors to catch up on the technologies we actually need, like uh, decent layout, uh, grid template, flexbox, all of that, that we're actually hacking right now with clothes. So up until we get these uh, HTML and CSS improvements, we're going to see a lot more digital publications which are just images at this point because they're simpler to render and yes, that's a 700 megabytes magazine but it will work across all of your devices because they're pre-rendered for each screen size. But do you agree in principle that um, it's an advantage if you know at least a, a little information about the viewport dimensions, for example, on the server, and that you accept that there's going to be a bit of, of uh, downscaling of images, but it, rather than enormous to very small, you can you can ship a sort of uh, you know a, a medium-sized image at the very least because you know something about the viewport dimensions on the server. Yeah, definitely. I I, I agree. You need that kind of information, but you need to be responsible in how you use it. For example, we had the example earlier. Uh, knowing the bandwidth and the bandwidth being wrong, you might assume something wrong about the device and give it um, a, a, a bad user experience or uh, a very good user experience, but the, the device cannot download it. So yeah, I do agree you need that kind of information server side 
um, as a developer, you need to use it and not make too many assumptions about the device. It's interesting, um, Ilya's point on, on media queries, that that is actually responsible for so much of, of what we discuss when it comes to responsive layout, right? Then the reason we're obsessed with viewport dimensions is because that's the one thing we have on the on the client to, to con well, you know, one of the chief things we have in CSS to control behavior. So um, it's got a lot, a lot to answer for in a way. <laughs> well, let's move on to the flip side of the coin. Um, with all this new stuff that we have to take into consideration, what about the arguments that responsive web design isn't worth it at all and that there is merit to just having normal um, zoom and swipe sites considering that's originally, um, you know, when Steve Jobs came on stage, he, you know, touted you could have the full web on your phone. I guess people want to create designs that that fit that device and if you look at what people create for the iPhone natively and the iPad natively it's not you know double tap to zoom in on a column and swipe around and I think that's what's driving what we want to do with web technology is the stuff that's happening native you know to try and create more engaging experiences to coin a phrase so we struggle to define what a web app really is sometimes but um, one possible definition is is to do with how immersive it is and and whether you feel your app has been designed for your screen and if you see the BB, the whole of the BBC news front page on a screen that size it's fantastically easy to get to the if you know the layout of the page you don't need to read the words you know that the link you're looking for is in the bottom right of the page it's it's super quick to get to that content but it doesn't feel so immersive um, but then maybe we go too far the other way that you get a beautiful layout with a full-sized image and you can you, you know you can swipe through 12 images and it's a satisfying experience but where the hell are the links to find my content and uh, we really have to take both kinds of um, directions before we find the answer. We were talking a bit earlier about pagination um, and what the solution is uh, for presenting text heavy sites and uh, visual media heavy sites in terms of pages. Do we want the content to scroll? Do we want it to be split into pages? And I think this this kind of thing, you know, the third option maybe is to present everything at once and then to have a, a tap to zoom kind of paradigm. It, it really depends on, on the, the content. The, the point I made was for the, for the FT and The Economist, I think pa pagination is really useful because if you are distracted or look away for some reason, everyone knows how to read a book. We all know that if you look away and you look back to the book, you have a rough idea that you are halfway down the right-hand column. And uh, But with, when, you, when you're looking at a single scrolling column of text, it's sometimes very hard. And, and I, I find that I have to concentrate more on on the mechanics of, of what I'm doing when I'm scrolling. And just to simply tap or swipe to, to go to the next page is great. But then you made the point that this is not at all appropriate for some, some other sites. Yeah, when you take into consideration um, media-rich uh, digital publications and you want to do it in a paginated, responsive view, you easily find that you're going to lose context between the text and illustrations or pictures the text is referring to if you want to embrace responsiveness. and. Uh, cutting off an image at the middle page is not really an option and if you do move the image or the illustration to a different page you end up with a lot of white space on your pages uh, which you can't really control and you have to understand that a lot of uh, digital publications um, are coming from print and that's where designers are used to having a lot of control over where content goes where text um, is on the same page with the illustration and the trade-off when you take on responsive uh, web design with paginated views that you lose a lot of that fine grain control over where your content is heading. So uh, I am actually keen to understand even more how people see pagination as an advantage on the web when we are accustomed to the paradigm of scrolling or tapping and where it makes sense, for example, in text heavy um, uh, articles like you mentioned, that, that's a very valid point, but does it make sense for anything else? So should responsive web design then emulate print is on a 27 inch screen is having six columns go all the way down and all the way across going to be easy to read? I think web design should emulate a bit of print and that's something the exclusions um, spec is doing and that's something specifically that should be in CSS because your uh, JavaScript is not really meant to do something like that. 
flowing text inside of shapes or around shapes. And typography as well. That's uh, like the hyphenation and stuff. It would be great to have yeah. good support for that, right? Uh, in terms of moving uh, the complete idea of print to digital, I think that's a wrong idea. Uh, you don't really get anything with um, six columns of text. You don't um, get more uh, information out of that um, out, out of that page, you have to understand that print has evolved like that into multi-column layout and having multiple articles on the same page because of the physical constraints of the page, something we don't have on the web. You can actually use the uh, device size to your advantage, and if you do have a large screen size, that doesn't mean you have to put in more columns because you have um, space. There's a, the point that George made. What's the distance uh, between the user and the device? Are you reading that on a TV? Six columns is not going to help. You're going to need a larger type and something optimized for your uh, laying back on the couch and reading the content. And any graphic designer will, will draw your attention to the whole concept of white space that that's, that really helps. I mean, maybe I was wrong with my slide going from the white gutters on the side to the filling all the available space because it's quite an assault visually to, to deal with that kind of thing. And white space is incredibly important. So for sure, the answer is no, we don't want to fill <laughs> a 27 inch monitor with, with columns. But we need to really learn a lot from print and then adopt it to our own. Yeah, I think it's natural that we look at things like print or what's been in the past to kind of inform what we're trying to do in a new medium. But the reality is it is a new medium and it's, it's still quite young. And these things, as we learn by adopting bits of print and some stuff does work, some stuff doesn't, um, we'll learn more about the medium that we're actually working in. That's assuming it doesn't move so fast that you know lessons we've learned one week aren't relevant the next but, you know when you consider we're now talking about tvs and the, the distance from the from the screen and things okay so um kind of on the same layout issue um oliver asked current uh, responsive web design solutions to grid systems make for very complicated presentational html um, defining the same behaviors with CSS, on the other hand, is very tricky. So what needs to be the middleman? Is that still JavaScript, or is there going to be something else? So I'm not sure that there is a middleman available at the moment. Um, if I had to, I, I think I understand what you're saying when you say there's lots, lots of presentational markup in, or lots of presentational class names in HTML. Um, and I, I think at the current point in time, that's the, the, the solution you should um, move towards. As I said, I, I find those kind of, you know, being able to have a layout system that is abstracted from everything else, a grid system, and then implement it in markup easily um, is very valuable, you know, for all the reasons we've talked about, ha making sure components are extracted from layout and pages. Um, and at the moment, the easiest and simplest, most maintainable way of doing that, in my view, is with more presentational class names. What we have coming in the future is, that I think will help this, is the grid layout module. Is that it? Okay. Um, so, we just have a couple minutes left. I have one more question for you very quickly. Um, if you could have one thing, anything in responsive web design um, approved by the spec or majorly implemented in any browsers, what would, you, what would your dream feature be? Overnight grid layout templates. <laughs> I think because of my work on column flow, I think regions. I'm not. I, I'm maybe I'm not so clear on on how they all interlink. But the the demos I've seen of regions just just look great. And and the idea of I've spent a long time flowing text into areas, and just to have something that will do that for me would be great. I'm I'm inclined to agree with grids mainly because I I get just as excited about new stuff that's going to make my life easier rather than sort of new shiny stuff. Um, and also um, media queries at a component level. However, that might be implemented. Don't call it media queries. But Well, I would like something for um, Retina, something easy. So, All right. Well, that is it for the responsive panel. And thank you, guys.